Good morning, Seaweed Bay family. Woo! Happy Sabbath day. Man, I look forward to this day, Monday through Saturday. And it always brings me great joy to see your faces. You are answered your prayer, your unanswered prayers for me. So I'm thankful to see each and every one of you. God didn't make a mistake in calling you to be here today to hear his word sung through worship songs as well as through his word as well as in prayer. We have a awesome worship service today. We are bringing back communion. So for those of you that do not have your communion cups, what our goal is starting this point forward is every first Sunday we will have communion together and fellowship with one another. It's one of the most intimate times that Jesus had with his disciples prior to um, going to the cross, and we commemorate that and what it means, which I'll discuss later. But if you do not have a communion combo pack, uh, we have got them spread out in the back on the table. Grab one starting from the back and move forward. There won't be a time where I say, hey, go get it now. So during the service, feel free to do that. That way we can, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Not admire. We can social distance well. I'll get it out here in a minute. I didn't have any coffee this morning. So uh, feel free to get that during the worship service and uh, prepare uh, for worship in the Lord. As always, I want to uh, offer two things. One. Uh, we now have a prayer box at the blessing box, not only for our Seaweed Bay body, but also for our community. For, so for those of you that are watching virtually, you have a family that will pray for you. And we have these cards right here that are over at the blessing box for you to fill out, put in the uh, prayer box. We'll check those every single day. You may get a text or an email or even a phone call letting you know that you're not alone that your family loves you, but most importantly, God does, and that we are here to support you and love you every step of the way. So feel free to fill those out. For those of you that are here, you can either put them in the tithe and offering basket uh, during, during this worship service, or you can also put it in our new prayer box. Um, also, with the blessing box, I want to thank the overwhelming response with our community, but our community is in need. Every time it gets filled, people come to get their needs met. And so we are continuously on a daily basis filling those things. So please keep up the awesome work of serving God and serving our community and loving our neighbors well. Uh, we need your help. So when you can, please uh, fit, come by the Blessing Box and offer some things to give to our community who is in need. Also, Operation Christmas Child has started up. If you have any questions on how you do that this year, please uh, Gail, raise your hand up in the air like you just don't care. Find Gail. Gail will give you direction. We have tons of boxes uh, in the back of our car, and she can give you directions on how to do that, on how we can serve not only the communities here but abroad so people can hear about Jesus Christ through Operation Christmas Child. Let me open this up in uh, God's Word. It's Psalm 89. I will sing of the steadfast love of the Lord forever. With my mouth, I will make him known, your faithfulness to all generations. For I said, steadfast love will be built up forever. In the heavens, you will establish your faithfulness. You have said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David, my servant. I will establish your offspring forever and build your throne for all generations. Let the heavens praise your wonders, O Lord your faithfulness in the assembly of the Holy Ones. I pray today that let Siwi Bay and this body of Christ praise your wonders, Lord. And may we do it with a fervent desire to want to serve him each and every day in every way. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for this Sabbath day. That you said that is made for us so that we can draw closer to you. So, Father, I pray that we come to you with open mind, heart, and soul to hear what you have to say to us, not only in your word, but also in the songs that we lift up and the prayers that we lift up to you. 
I lift up prayers for each and every person that is here today. Whatever things that are going on, whether spoken or unspoken, Father, you know all about them. So I pray that your overwhelming comfort just overflows upon them today. So that whatever anguish or worry or concern or even celebrations, Father, they just feel your love regardless. May we come to you, come to this altar, and just bring it all to the altar today so that we can be free from it all and love you better. It's in Jesus' name we all pray. Amen. Amen. Welcome to worship at Seaweed Bay. my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Jesus, Messiah.
as we discussed earlier, you know, this world, we tend to just have lunch, and we don't think about how important it was back in biblical times to gather around and fellowship. You know, one of our biggest pieces of scripture is Acts 42 through 47, about after the day of Pentecost, the fellowship of believers came together, and they broke bread, and they fellowshiped, and they learned from God's word, and they did that because of that personal relationship that they had, not just with Christ, but who moved them to have personal relationships with people of all walks of life. And that Jesus started that years ago, thousands of years ago, with his disciples when he was sitting in an upper room and he was reclined back and he had given thanks and he took some bread and he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And so he took the bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and he gave it to them saying this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then he followed that up and said likewise the cup after they had eaten saying this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. And so every first Sunday of every month, we want to gather as a fellowship of believers and remember what Christ has done for us, that there's nothing that we can possibly do to earn our salvation. Christ has done it all. By the body that was broken, which is represented through the bread, and through the blood that was sacrificed for you and me across the cro- on the cross to give us forgiveness for all of our sins, past, present, and future. So I ask you now, in remembrance of our Lord and Savior, to open your communion cup and to take of the bread. And do this in remembrance of him. I'd ask you to take the cup, which represents his blood, shed on the cross for you and me to thank the Lord and Savior for what he has done and what he will continue to do so that we may live eternally on earth as we will in heaven and to take this cup in remembrance of him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for giving your Son to come to this earth to fellowship with whom the world believed were a bunch of undesirables, but he knew they were desirable to him. So that every man, woman, and child thereafter could see the true kingdom of God for what it was. Not a religion, but for a relationship with the Son of God. So, Father, thank you for this opportunity, for this fellowship of believers to commune together, to celebrate what had to happen in order for us to even have this fellowship now. It's only in the name of Jesus Christ that we stand here and are able to commune with him. It's in his name that we pray. Amen.
paid for what we do. But I pray heaven is like rain on a tin roof, washing away, washing away my sorrows, giving me faith. Time still, and the mountains won't move. Maybe we all have wings, and that's only good news. They say that living water is the fountain of youth, but I pray heaven is like a rain on a tin roof, washing away. Washing away my sorrows, giving me faith, giving me faith, giving me faith to follow a new tomorrow. Yes, in the promised land, there are mansions for me and you. But I pray heaven is like a rain on a tin roof. Rain on a tin roof. Would you pray with me? Father, we look forward today when we stand face to face with you. Each one of us secure in where we are and whose we belong. But today, today we need to learn to follow you better. Today we need to remember what it is to worship and praise your name every moment of every day. So you, we pray that, that you open our ears and, and give us eyes to see so that we might hear the message that Chris has to bring today. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, uh, David and Amanda, that song is uh, a duo by Blessing Ofer and uh, Chris Tomlin. And I heard it about three weeks ago, and it has just been ringing in my ears just for the past three weeks. Because as believers in Christ, we sometimes get this until then. And Jesus is like, no, 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 right now. You have heaven on earth right now. I am with you. Always, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. So live like it. And so to hear that song about praying that heaven is like rain on a tin roof. I, maybe it's just the country boy in me. But there is nothing more peaceful and comforting than sitting in a back porch somewhere on a rocker. And just hearing the rain fall on a roof line. Especially a tin roof line. So I pray that whatever stuff you may be going through today that you understand that heaven can give you that peace. Jesus Christ has given you that peace and you don't have to wait to go attain it. Christ died for you so you could live it today, tomorrow, and even in eternity. So thank you, David and Amanda, for sharing that spiritual song with us. And I pray that you download it and listen to it this week, especially during this awesome, positive political season that we're in right now, right? Well, good morning, Siwi Bay family. Happy Sabbath day. 
As Lindsay and I celebrated our 14th wedding anniversary this past Wednesday, God bless Went Lindsay, right? Woo! Yeah, she needs a lot of whoop. She has to put up with me. I was able to reflect on our relationship. I remember getting so incredibly nervous in asking her for that first date. I remember that rush of excitement to see her upon returning to Knoxville for a weekend after being working in another part of the country for two weeks straight. I remember her smile upon seeing me. Now there has also been some pain, some frustration within our relationship. And it has stretched our relationship further than either could have ever thought. But through it all, after 14 years, her approval, her love, definitely her mercy, and her forgiveness is always in the forefront. Sometimes I am a godly husband, but others I totally miss the mark. And my wife said, Amen. Relationships have evolved throughout our lives, right? From that first boyfriend or girlfriend or from our first friendships to our first business contacts to even our first church relationship. And in my experience, we have this drive to be accepted. We want to be accepted by others, right? And so we either change ourselves to be accepted by them or are accepted for who we are. Our sinful nature, though, seems to get the best of us at times, and it works our way into changing ourselves way too much to be like others, especially in the church. And then inevitably, once we try to reinvent ourselves, we become exhausted at being someone that we aren't, or our chosen idols, whom we're trying to change ourselves for, for reveal their true identity towards us and ends with results of pain and even skepticism in the future. If you've ever felt this way or going through this now, especially if it's happening here, as your pastor, I'm sorry. Because that's not the way the body of Christ should be. But remember that people, they let us down. Because they're just as sinful as we are, including your pastor. How can we live free from this knowing that we're going to encounter this? Why can't we just be accepted? And we can learn a lot from the first-hand experiences of Peter within his own life. But also, most importantly, his experiences with Jesus. Jesus tells Peter in Matthew chapter 16, after Simon Peter is the, one of the disciples that says, Christ, you are the Son of God. And Jesus says, I tell you, you are Peter, or Petra in the Greek. And on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I'll give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth, or in heaven shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now we all know Peter wasn't perfect, just like the rest of us. He denied Christ not once, not twice, but three times, as Christ had foretold while he was with him, and as Christ was marching his way to Calvary to die, not only for Peter's sin of denial but also our sins of denial, among many others, from our past, our present, and our future. Christ knew. Christ knew Peter's denial upon giving him that great honor and saying, here are the keys of the kingdom of heaven. But he also knew the redemption that would come to Peter 
and how the redemptive impacts on Peter's life would affect his ministry through him. So as we open our Bibles to the book or the Gospel of Mark, I want you to remember, and I'll continue to do this, that Peter, who was more than likely in prison during Emperor Nero's reign around the mid-60s, was awaiting and probably awaiting his impending death for his faith. And so he's sitting in this prison cell along with John Mark on the other side of the cell and given a final account of Jesus Christ and his transformation through his own relationship with Jesus Christ. Now whether it was Peter's uncertainty for his time remaining or his certainty in Jesus' salvation for all, he doesn't allow Mark to mince any words. And he gives us an account with the conclusion at the very beginning. And we talked about it right in the first verse of the Gospel of Mark. Peter says, The beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Jesus wasn't a rabbi. He wasn't a prophet. He wasn't a legend. Jesus was and is the Messiah. Jesus was and is the Son of God. And it was Son of God in the flesh to Peter. And Jesus is the good news. Jesus is Lord. And then Jesus arrived in Galilee and began professing the good news by saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. And over the past couple of weeks, we have dissected what that meant. He was saying the prophets and the law have all spoken about this time in me. I am here. The king and his kingdom is here. It's more than a fortress in Jerusalem. It's more than a Jewish nation. It's relationship over religion. And as Jesus starts presenting this by not only his teaching, but also by his actions, he begins disrupting the Jewish mindset of works over grace from the very beginning. From healing a paralytic's sin first, and then his physical disability. And then having the audacity to ask awful tax collectors and sinners to fellowship with him at his table to approving of his own followers to taking grain on the Sabbath day. And he confronts the Pharisees about this Sabbath day mindset that they had and said the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And so the Son of Man is Lord over the Sabbath. Jesus is saying, I love people more than my laws. That's why God sent me. So I'd ask you to open your Bibles today to Mark chapter 3, verses 13 through 34. We're going to kind of break this up a little bit in in chunks, and I want to just go ahead and give you the big idea first. I've kind of mentioned it about three times already. It's relationship over religion. It's relationship over religion religion. I'd ask you to follow with me in Mark chapter 3 verses 13 through 34. I'm going to read I'm going to read the whole thing. Yeah. And he went up on the mountain and called to him those whom he had desired. And they came to him. And he appointed twelve whom he had also named apostles so that they might be with him and he might send them out to preach and have authority to cast out demons. He appointed the twelve, Simon to whom he gave the name Peter, James the son of Zebedee, and John the brother of James to whom he gave the name the Bornagers, that is, sons of thunder. 
Andrew and Philip and Bartholomew and Matthew and Thomas and James the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus and Simon the zealot and Judas the Iscariot who betrayed him. And then he went home and the crowd gathered again so that they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him for they were saying, he's out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, he is possessed by Beelzebub and by the prince of demons. He cast out demons. And he called them to him and he said to them in parables, how can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but is coming to an end. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man, then indeed may plunder his house. Truly I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the children of man and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemies against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they were saying he has an unclean spirit. And his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him, and a crowd was sitting around him. They said to him, Your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. And he answered them, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your relationship you had with Peter that moved him so overwhelming that he called John Mark, even in the midst of his impending death, to say, I have to share this with you so that others know about the true Jesus. So Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit comes upon this place cleanses us from any sins or any distractions that we may have to hear you speak to us. And once we hear your voice, Father, may it never fall on deaf ears. May it convict mind, heart, and souls that we go out and tra be transformed by our relationship with you and share it with others. It's only in the name of Jesus we can stand here and even worship him. In his name we pray. Amen. You know, there's some moments where Jesus talks about something special here. He says, He went up to the mountain and called to him those whom he desired. And they came to him. None of these men, from verse 13, were highly educated or religious elite. And by the world's standards, they were just ordinary. Jesus chose them anyway. Because he knew everything about them, and he knew their future impacts for his kingdom. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 says, for consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to the world's worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God shows what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God shows what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God shows what is low and despised in the world. Even things that are not to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. So that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. You know, we talked about experiences 
both negative and positive that many of us have had not only in our personal relationships but also in our spiritual relationships and personal ones here within a church in a church body and in that context there there is this difference between a hypocrite which the world sees as many people within the church and a humble servant of God hypocrites lord their professed salvation over others yet rarely offer empathy in light of salvation so others may have that same redemption. Let me say that again. Hypocrites lord their professed salvation over others, yet rarely offer empathy in light of that salvation so others may have that redemption too. We also use our inadequacies or works as an excuse to not share the good news because we don't trust God. We profess loudly on Facebook and very loudly on social media to be on Team Jesus, but we never leave the bench. And when Jesus called out the twelve, they didn't ask for some more time to give a counteroffer or seek a contract in negotiating the terms of that call. He called, and they came. When I read that, I was reminded, I can show you exactly where God moved me out of my seat to confess my sin and seek Christ as my Savior and Lord at a revival in Union University in Jackson, Tennessee. I could probably take you to the exact spot just outside the baseball field. I can show you exactly where God brought me to my knees to apply for seminary within the home that I live in now. There is nothing subtle about God's hand in our lives. And throughout his word, people were moved by his call and his ministry on earth. All of these disciples, these 12 men, ultimately gave their life by proclaiming that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Even Judas, who overladen with guilt, gave his own life, realized what he had done and that Jesus was the Lord. Jesus, in this text, he didn't call them for a cup of coffee. It says he appointed the twelve so that he might be with them and he might send them out to preach and have authority to cast out demons. He called them to learn from him. He called them to share his good news. He called them to give them authority to cast out demons demons he would give them all they needed the good news is nothing without Jesus Christ we can't cast out demons but Jesus can he has called us to learn from him through his word through sharing his good news and to confront demons within our midst but we aren't the apostles. I get that. We aren't the apostles because we have our own identity crisis. We'll claim Jesus Christ as Savior of our sin, but we don't want to claim Him as Lord in our life. Did you hear that? We'll happily claim Jesus as the Savior of our sin, but we do not want to claim Him as leading our life. He can save us from our sins, but He's not allowed to run my life. Go back to your salvation box, Jesus. I got this part covered. And if this is your idea of Jesus Christ, it's just that. It's just an idea. 
unlike other relationships with a desire to be accepted by everyone and everything. Ephesians 1, 7 says, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the richness of His grace. And as redeemed and forgiven people, we desire for Christ to transform our lives in His image. We even pray about that through His prayer. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we readily admit that we can't do it on our own. And this transformation may bring both positive and negative reactions from others, including your family. And Jesus can empathize with this also. You see in verse 20 and 21 of this text in chapter 3, he goes home and this crowd's gathering and they couldn't even eat. <clears throat> and his family hears about it. And so they go out to seize him. And they say, he's out of his mind. And then you jump down into verses 31 through 35 and it's his mother, Mary, and his brothers. And they're standing outside and they're calling him. The crowd's sitting around and they're saying, hey, your mom and your siblings are outside. And he answered him and says, who are my mother and my brothers? And he looks around the group and fellowship that he has within that home and he says, here are my mother and brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. Think, think about that for a second. Mary. Mary now. Jesus' mother who's been visited by an angel about her son, has now gathered the rest of the family not to talk to him at first, but to seize him. They're going to go take Jesus to a counseling session. And when their first intervention doesn't work, they decided to call him outside. Now on a side note, if you are proclaiming to be a man, to be the son of God in a story. Would you ever mention that his own family questioned his, his sanity? I don't think so either, yet here we are in the word. And Jesus says in Matthew 10, verses 21 through 22, Brother will deliver brother over to death and the father is child. And children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But the one who endures to the end will be safe. You want to talk to someone who is speaking from experience? While his mothers and brothers are standing outside. He redefines family in the kingdom of God. Whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. Jesus didn't say whoever is a Jew. He didn't say whoever looks like me. He didn't say whoever has the best worship. Whoever does the will of God. And they can't do it to gain salvation. They do it because of their salvation and relationship with the Son of God. Just as the apostles were called, they just do it. In light of this train wreck, which has been this political season of 2020, have we not figured out that salvation comes from the Lord, not the president? Reconciliation of a people will not come from a president, but only God. Because God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world. You want revival within this community? It won't come by simply regathering face to face. 
but we have to have the presence of the Lord within our midst on Sunday through Saturday. Last week I asked you, are you a Pharisee or are you a Levi? This week I ask you another question. Are you doing the will of God or obstructing it? Are you doing the will of God or obstructing it? Romans chapter 12 says, I appeal to you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Now, when people live, work, and play alongside you on a daily basis, do they see you as an ordinary person that is extraordinarily different? through your salvation? Jesus isn't focused on our financial success on earth. He's focused on our eternal relationship with Him. So our spouses, our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren, our neighbors, and our families can see them, see Him too. Did you hear Romans 12, 1 again? Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. That's every day, not just Sunday for an hour. It's worship 24-7. This is relationship over religion. And it's the essence of Christianity. We have too many religious exercises and not enough relationships with a Savior and Lord. The main thing is to keep Jesus the main thing in everything that we do. And when we don't behave like this, We look like the scribes in verses 22 through 30. They're so confused by the way Jesus is interacting with people and how he is changing and disrupting their traditions. They claim that he's Satan. He's like, okay, how can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom can't stand. And if a house is divided against itself that house will not be able to stand. He says, No one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Then indeed he may plunder his house. Satan can't cast himself out. And as I was reading that text, I wanted to ask you to think about where we are as a country now. And what if we put, if a country is divided against itself, that country cannot stand? Seen any examples of that today? Verse 25 breaks my heart because I have seen way too many homes divided, not because of football, but because of the lack of relationship and fellowship with Jesus Christ, and it's destroying the family. It is very easy to give up hope because all of us are hurting tremendously. 1 Corinthians 15, 19 says, If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. If our only thing and our only hope is just in this life, we are most to be pitied. But we don't have hope in this life because we have eternal life. 
Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21 says, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Jesus Christ is able to bring this country together far more abundantly than all that we ask or think. Jesus Christ is able to reconcile stressed marriages and families far more abundantly than all that we ask or think. And I can say this with confidence, and you should too, because Christ reconciled my life with him first as he did you. And since Christ is in my life, my marriage and my children are constantly being reconciled and strengthened, not for the Hamel's glory, but for God's glory. Jesus gives the scribes a little foreshadowing in verses 27 and 28 of this text when he talks about no one can enter the strong man's house and plunder his goods. No man can enter Satan's house and plunder his goods. But the Son of Man will bind Satan once and for all and plunder his goods. He has already freed us from our sins. But are we willing to seek forgiveness for them? Today, today is the day that Christ is no longer just an idea in your life. I ask you to allow Christ to be your Savior and Lord. Allow Christ to lead your life as He has written it, not as you want to revise it. And allow Him to begin a relationship with you for the first time by answering His call. By learning from Him. And then sharing it with others about how He has changed your life just as He had changed Peter's too. So as the worship team comes forward, I'd like everyone just to close their eyes and to talk to the Lord at this moment. And for those of you who seek his face for the first time or want to renew it or strengthen it even more, I ask you to pray this prayer with me. Dear Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. I am a chief among sinners. And I ask you now for your forgiveness for all of my sins. Allow me to forgive myself. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. Cleanse me now from all of my sin. And I turn from my sins and I invite you to reign in my life forever. I want to trust I want to follow you as my Lord and Savior. Amen. Whether you're taking that prayer for the first time or renewing it to be changed and have a life transformed through Christ, you don't walk alone. We are all empathetic to where each of us are. Each of us have walked that journey and found Christ and it transformed our life forever and we want to walk along with you. As your pastor, I will be here at the side to welcome you, to pray with you as the worship team offers this invitation song. May the people see, hear, and feel 
the fullness of joy through Jesus' salvation within our lives as we share it with others today.
want to thank each of you for joining us for worship today. A mighty God is He. And I pray that He's not an idea for you. I pray that you can honestly say you have a relationship. And if you don't, then come speak to me. Give me a call. Let me discuss with you how Christ changed my life and how He became more than just an idea. He became my Savior and my Lord. He didn't call you here by accident. He called you to hear this purposefully. So I pray you wrestle with this the rest of this week and draw closer into that relationship with Him and share it with others. As a fellowship of believers, we always celebrate enjoying time together, but we also celebrate birthdays. Sean Daniel is going to be celebrating a birthday. Uh, tomorrow, is that right? Is that right? So let's wish Sean a happy birthday. Priscilla? Happy birthday to you. Cha, cha, cha. Happy Teenagers, I know y'all love that, so yeah, that's cool. It's cool. We love you. Happy birthday. Um, before you leave, and before I give the benediction prayer, as many of you know, we're a part of First Baptist Church. Uh, we we are under the leadership and the guidance of the elders. Uh, they have some uh, vacancies or some openings that are about to happen. Most elders are on a three-year term, so if you are a member of this church and uh, are interested in being nominated or want to nominate someone to become an elder to represent Seaweed Bay as well as the whole church. Uh, the nomination forms are on the back uh, near the uh, communion cups. Feel free to fill those out. Hand those to me or put them in the tithe and offering baskets. I think we're going to do that for the next two weeks. Uh, so if you have any questions, feel free to contact me uh, and I'm happy to uh, discuss, it with it, discuss that with you even more. So let's go to the Lord in prayer and uh, go out and make disciples who make disciples. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time and this fellowship. But Father, I pray that each of us don't just package it back up in a little box and go put it into our Sundays for one hour, that we continue the spiritual worship with you every single minute of every single day. So Father, I pray that we become more transformed into the image that you've created us to be so that we can become better spouses, better colleagues, better friends or neighbors, and better children of yours. Father, I lift up this country, but I also lift up this world. I lift up our president who has been stricken with COVID-19, but I lift up all of those who are sick and afflicted, whether with a physical ailment or a spiritual one, Father. And I pray, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, that every man, woman, and child hears about the transformation and the salvation through Christ and Christ alone and seeks that spiritual healness first, and then heal their bodies, heart, mind, and soul, and the physical ones as well. Father, be with these people now. That every word that was spoken, whether through song, or through prayer, and through your word in Scripture, that it doesn't fall on deaf ears. That they fight with it. That they struggle with it and wrestle with it throughout the rest of this day. Because this is the day that you've given us. And through that continuous battle, Father, that they draw closer to you and proclaim you to be Lord in their life. Grant us peace, Father. Peace and comfort like sitting on that back porch listening to raindrops fall on the tent roof. Give us this comfort that can only come through your Son. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us at Seaweed Bay.